You are listening to the Regeneration Rising podcast, a podcast from the Kavira Coalition about the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of agrarians in the United States. Each episode will explore what it means to work in regenerative agriculture, how people came to choose this as their livelihood, and why it's important to them and the future. We hope to build a foundation for a strong community of future agrarians and land stewards with a regenerative approach to community, relationships, and the land. Hello and welcome back to Regeneration Rising. I'm Taylor Molia, and my brilliant guest today is Hannah Breckbill, co-farmer at Humble Hands Harvest in Decorah, Iowa. We're going to talk about a creative way Hannah has found to afford farmland, as well as some interesting ideas about structuring a farm business as a cooperative. And as if Hannah was not brilliant enough, she is also building community amongst queer farmers across the nation through the Queer Farmer Network. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. I'm very excited to jump in. Thank you for joining us. At first, I just wanted to mention a very cool event coming up that our listeners might be interested in. The Kibera Coalition and Seven Oaks Ranch are excited to partner to provide a multi-day workshop to learn about organic amendments, soil health, and wildlife habitat. June 16th through 19th, 2023, we will meet to learn how to make and use biochar, hear about range management and pollinators, and enjoy a star party on a dark skies ranch in Ozona, Texas. Sounds very fun. We encourage women and young people to attend to build networking and capacity for regenerative rangeland stewardship. More details and registration can be found at kiviracoalition.org slash events. Okay, on to our interview. Thanks for joining us and hope you enjoy. Hannah, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. We're super excited to have you. Excited to be here. So um, tell us where you're calling in from today. Yeah, I'm calling in from um, actually the Friends Meeting House in Decorah, Iowa. The internet in my house is not good enough to record a podcast, so I get to I get to find places in town to do that. <laughs> yep, not uncommon for an ag podcast. <laughs> so um, let's kind of go back to your beginnings. You you weren't originally from an ag family. You said your your parents were academics and you yourself got a math major. So tell us what, what first got you excited about agriculture. Yeah, I was an academic. I thought I was going to be a, an academic my whole life. And, and then about halfway through college is when when I started thinking about what I actually wanted to do with my life and and what kind of meaning I wanted to have behind the work that I was, that I did. Um, And that kind of got me into thinking about how could I plug in as, as an activist or as someone who, who is like making the world better as my primary motivation. And um, yeah, that led to me exploring a bunch of different things, but landing up with a group of people who are doing food and and farming activism. And that felt like a really very concrete and tangible thing that I could do. And it was, yeah, very concretely like making the world better for someone by feeding them. And so that, that's what got me into farming. I would say that my, my motivations and, and my context has shifted a whole lot from that kind of original point, but that's, yeah, that's what what got me into it. Just this idealism, this desire to do something tangible that that was useful to people and, and made the world better. Absolutely. So yeah, you began working on vegetable farms. And then, you know, after a while, sort of the natural progression is to take the step up and start your own farm. So that's what you did. You started Humble Hands Harvest. Tell us about what was that process like? Like, what did you want your own farm business to look like? Yeah, I had been working on vegetable farms for a few years out of college and then and then I took that step and the opportunity came up for me to rent land from um from a different farm in Minnesota that was doing grass-fed beef and that kind of thing and so they just had some extra land that they could they could spare for a vegetable farm for a two acre vegetable farm. So that's what I did. I I jumped on that opportunity. And yeah, I was kind of in, in a place, I was 24 years old, I think, or 25. And I I was just in this place of being 
kind of open to whatever happened. I wasn't super attached to anything. I was single. I was, you know, I liked the town that I was living in, but I felt like I could try other places too. And so I moved to, to Minnesota and I, and I started the farm business. But one thing that I did know from the beginning was that ultimately I didn't want to be running a farm business by myself. I, I wanted to have people to, to work with and to be, to be co-owners or equally invested in the business with me. So I knew that from the beginning, but it also, the opportunity was there and I was the only one there to take it. So I, I started by myself with the farm business and, and I started, I took the plunge and I just went full time right away. So I, I had accumulated some savings from my jobs and I put that into kind of farm equipment and that kind of thing. And Starting in in March in greenhouse season, I I quit my winter job and I just went into farming full time and which was a pretty big risk in retrospect, <laughs> um, but but it worked really well for me to be able to just focus on on the one business and and I started making income when when crops started coming in in June so then then I was able to kind of float it. <laughs> so yeah, that was the, that was the origin story of Humble Hands Harvest. And then it took four years of renting land before I found a, a permanent spot. So yeah, I guess we, we might get into that a little bit more later, but I, yeah, I had started this farm in just a quick way um, and a simple way. And as soon as I started reading about like farming and like really thinking about what I was doing, I, I encountered ideas about perennial agriculture and stuff like that. And I, I really started thinking about, wait, if I actually want to make an impact on the landscape, not just run a vegetable business and, and grow things, but actually want to make an impact that makes the land better, that makes the community of life on the land better, then I need to be doing something more than just vegetable growing. I need to be um, investing in perennial crops and that kind of thing. And that's a really hard thing to see my way to as a year to year tenant farmer. So that was a, that was a pretty big struggle for me to figure out how to, yeah, how to, how to really do what I wanted to do as a farmer, given the context that I was in. And so that, that's what ultimately motivated me to want to, buy land and and own land so that I could make those long-term investments that would make the land better. And I yeah wouldn't be risking that. Yeah, this is something we talk about a lot with young farmers and, and leasing land is just getting really excited about these models and then looking at the opportunities that you have and, and I don't know, getting <laughs> a little sad because you can't like, you know, planting, doing even stuff like um, key line design, any of these sort of big infrastructure type. And when it comes to like, you know, processing sheds and all of these different buildings that you might need for farming, all these long term investments, it is really hard to convince yourself that that's a good business idea because you could just get kicked out the next year. And it's just, yeah. Were you looking for more of the ecological function of trees or were you actually looking for the crop to sell in your CSA? Both. I think my primary motivation is actually the ecological function or like building a system that can produce food long-term without that annual kind of input cycle, but definitely have always used vegetables as like my cash flow <laughs> for so I, I'm not expecting a huge return on the trees that I've planted, although they are going to start producing fruit at some point. <laughs> it would probably be really painful being in that amazing Midwest climate where things grow so <laughs> easily because there's so much water over there. It's a shame to not grow perennial crops because it just happens so naturally. It's, it's kind of a, a no brainer. So <laughs> it's like every bit small scale vegetable farm is something that they can easily incorporate. And so, yeah, I, I hear that frustration. Yeah. And so let's, let's dive into sort of the next steps. Like we, we kind of talked about before that you have developed a community-based land holding company. And so that was after leasing for a little bit, you decided to to kind of move on to this next step. So explain a little more about how this came about. So I was a beginning farmer. I was actually in my second year of farming when this happened. 
and I was renting land in Minnesota still. My community back in Decorah, Iowa, which was where I had worked on farms before, was, yeah, I was still really connected to that community there. And there was a piece of land that was just 22 acres that was going up for sale, actually going to be taken to auction. And the the neighbor up the road from that land who happened to be a friend of mine was really worried about what would happen when when the land went to auction because here in the midwest i mean right now here in the midwest land is going for thirty thousand dollars an acre at auction farmland is which is absurd um (laughs) but yeah so he was worried about what would happen he thought it was probably going to be a hog confinement operator who would buy it and use that land to spread their manure if not actually put a hot confinement there. And he didn't want that happening in the neighborhood. So he's the one who kind of organized or schemed up the, the company and organized the people to, to join it. So they created an LLC that in Iowa, LLCs are allowed to own a certain amount of land. So he created this, this company that would own the land. And he asked the landowner that was selling what she wanted in price and they came to an agreement and then he found basically investors or shareholders to join the company and to have enough capital or investment in that company to be able to buy that land from the landowner. So that happened in 2014 with about about 20 people buying in at $5,500 an acre and um, and it was 22 acres total. So different people had different amounts of investment depending on depending on what they were able to do. And and I actually, I had got wind of this happening back in Decorah and I I thought, hey, like this is my chance to to start thinking about buying land. And so I, I put in a little bit of investment as well. And so, yeah, at that point I was able to be part of the decision-making process of what was going to happen on that land. So fast forward a number of years, basically I was able to, slowly over time, buy different people out and buy their shares from them so that I could eventually I accumulated eight acres worth of shares, also using a loan from my uncle um, to help support some of that. And, And we were able to parcel off eight acres of the 22 that could go into my name so that I could start investing in that infrastructure that we were talking about in a well, in electricity, and in a deer fence, yeah, a greenhouse and that kind of thing. And uh, because that that land holding company hadn't been willing to take those risks on, right? They they wanted they wanted someone to just rent the land from them, and and so they had they had originally like gotten a hay renter to take over the land. But at this point, I was able to buy that piece, start investing in those infrastructure, and then rent the rest of the land where I grazed my sheep for starters. So that was a really cool, like kind of random process, the way that it happened. Like it was a really nice amount of things kind of coming together in the right way. Like the farmer, the land and the investors who could buy the land and hold it. And yeah, at this point in time, I'm actually really working hard to try to recreate that as a more as a more intentional thing as a less random thing and so getting getting some community members involved here in Decora still to to think about what it looks like to to actually make an investment cooperative that whose purpose would be to buy farmland that's appropriate for for farmers for beginning farmers who then are able to like take it on slowly over time kind of ease into ownership instead of instead of all of this land just going to auction and being sold for top dollar and beginning farmers not having a way in. This is really cool. I think, you know, it can it looks different in other parts of the country, obviously, because, you know, 20 acres here in Colorado is not the same as 20 acres in Iowa. But um, I really I think that is such a cool model. I, I have so many questions, the first of them being so just to clarify so you've got investors into this LLC, and then you are essentially purchasing shares. Do they sell you their shares and their shares get smaller and smaller? And then eventually, those investors are just no longer a part of the LLC? Yeah, exactly. That happened in our case anyway. So they're essentially that this is functioning as 
is the community is taking on this purchase and essentially it, it would be like they're kind of serving the purpose of a bank essentially right because they're taking on that that initial investment and then you're buying pieces from them at no interest correct so that's the difference is like instead of doing a traditional loan where you would pay a ton of interest these are just people who are saying we don't care about making more money we just we're putting this money in for a little bit for someone to use it and then once we're done we'll take the same amount of money that we put in like they're not walking away with a with a greater amount of money correct no they aren't okay yeah they made decision very early on in in their kind of meetings when they've kind of suddenly had this land. One person I remember raised his hand and said, I don't think we should be speculating on this land. I think we should sell shares for the price that we bought them for. And everyone else was like, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Isn't that so revolutionary? We were talking about that at the Regenerate conference. Actually, there was a speaker who was saying that, yeah, there is, I mean, we're talking about Generally, these investors seem like people of all different wealth levels, right? We're not talking about ultra wealthy people, but in her case at the conference, we were talking about how there is, I mean, it is kind of, <laughs> it's kind of a, a, a crazy idea, but, but some things don't need to be money making ventures. Like some things, your money can just serve a purpose and and that's that's it. That it will not gain you more money. <laughs> there are maybe more sentimental things that you can gain besides an increase in capital in your investment. Yeah. So tell me more about these investors. Like, how did you find these investors originally? What kind of people are they? Yeah. Tell me more. Yeah. It's actually really interesting because the original kind of group of people that invested, Steve, who's the guy who started it all, he contacted a bunch of neighbors of the land, a bunch of people in the neighborhood, and it just happened to coincide with the annual meeting of our local Peace and Justice Center. And so and so the the crowd at the Peace and Justice Center at that time, which is 10 years ago at this point almost, they uh, a lot of retired folks, a lot of do-gooders who lived in town and that that was kind of the the vibe of the, those initial investors. There were a few other people. There were a few people like me who who were younger and thinking about accessing land and and you know had had some different motivations. But uh, by and large, the the main group was was retired people. But now at this point, it's it's actually really interesting because I I've started asking around in the community again, and I've I've used my farm as an example because at this point. Our farm has bought all of the shares back. And so it's soon to be fully in our name as owners. So that was a nine-year process to have that happen. But so the, the people that I've been talking to in the community about, about kind of doing this again, the people who are most excited about it are, are people who are now like my age, like in their 30s, 40s and and want to put a little bit in, you know, and don't have a lot to put in or anything. They're not huge investors, but they they want to have a stake in land in their community and they want to be part of something that that moves the needle a little bit about who gets to own land and and that kind of thing. So it's a it's a really cool cool vibe. And there are also people who are older who are also interested and often have a little bit more cash, which is nice. And it's a it's a cool group of of people to be part of and to dream with. Wow. Yeah. And so if this LLC is made up of, I mean, it gets complicated when you have so many more members. It's like a co-op, you know, it's like any co-op. That's obviously a huge question is the democracy piece of like, who gets to say, does that depend on how much stake you have in this LLC? So how did that process go for you? Did they have to decide? I mean, you were a shareholder from the beginning. In a, in a smaller way. But did you guys have a meeting together to decide democratically, we're going to choose Hannah for this farm? Or so how does how are those decisions made? In that original LLC, it was, it was a voting process that was one share, one vote. And some people had multiple shares and some people only had one. So that was interesting. And, and what that meant was that as I as I started buying shares, I started having more decision-making power, which was which is a interesting side effect of of doing that. But yeah, there was a meeting at some point where the kind of intention was expressed. It was, like, and and this is after my 
initial like being able when I, when I first took the eight acre chunk and put it in my name, that was that was when things like really got real <laughs> for, for the rest of the shareholders who were like, oh, Hannah's Hannah's like very much doing this, um, <laughs> and so at that point is when is when there was a meeting and it like, got written in the note in the minutes, you know that that our intention from now on is to sell shares to humble hands harvest and not, uh, yeah, not. And that's, that's kind of the ultimate destination of, of what's going to happen here. Um, so, so that was an understanding that was, that was there for a while. I, I like that too, because it seems like a really simple, well, I'm very curious to know about what your next, this next venture is in terms of continuing to replicate this, because I can see an instance in which you have a lot of different people bidding on this property. It seems like it was a natural fit. Like you were already a shareholder. You had the training. You're ready to go. Sounds like you had a bit of capital investment to begin with. Um, I could see another situation in which the company doesn't have a person identified and there's people maybe submitting applications for the land in order to do this relationship but I do kind of like how they're so selling it to you and then you can come up with your own cooperative model underneath this business instead of, because I could see it getting a little messy at some point if they were like, okay, these three acres are going to this person, but they're going to buy them eventually. And then she's going to get these acres. And oh, totally. so, yeah, yeah, I, 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 my brain likes that it was just one person that it was like, this is the whole point of this whole venture is just to get this land to this one person. It feels very nice and clean to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I am, I'm also curious about what's going to happen with, with what we're building now, because uh, first of all, I think we're going to build it in a, in a actually more officially cooperative way, which means one member, one vote rather than one share, one vote. So, uh, uh, yep. so that's a little bit more democratic, which is exciting to me. Yeah, and I'm 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 not sure we ha- we we also still don't have a farmer identified, nor do we have land identified at this point. So that yeah, that'll be a, a kind of coming together. And I'm kind of excited about the few years that I anticipate um, between purchasing land and having a farmer identified that like makes sense on both sides because we as a as a group as a cooperative get to get to figure out how to manage the land together and that's a that's a yeah shining moment for democracy <laughs> I, I would say to, to like really think of, as a group about like what we want to to build on on the landscape and then be able to hand that over to to the farmers who are actually doing that work at some point in a, in a yeah kind of easy transition. Let's kind of talk about some of the lessons that you've learned. Like, were there any sort of sticky situations where you where you didn't anticipate trouble? Or was there some other lessons where it was like, oh, we're so happy we designed it like this because it was really, it was really beneficial. So yeah, what were some of the big lessons that someone else was sort of toying with this idea would be really helpful to pass on? The thing that's coming to mind for me right now is like, just the fact that lawyering is really hard um, because lawyers get really just love to get into weeds. One thing that I really liked about the model that we had is, yes, we had lawyers check over the initial bylaws. They got involved in, at a few points and like whenever the land transactions happened, the lawyers need to be involved. But yeah, but in my opinion, and I think I think many lawyers would even agree with this, is like a lot of the stuff doesn't have to go through like super official legal jargon. Like we can just make agreements as people. And um and so like remembering that and like not getting bogged down in like is this like precise method legal and and actually just being like okay where are we now where do we want to go what agreements can we make as people that will get us to those places and then as we need lawyers to officially get there we can bring them in but yeah i just notice a lot of bogging down sometimes in in different contexts like that I can absolutely see that. Yeah, cuz you've also well you're you're pioneering. I'm I'm sure you're not pioneering. I'm sure many people have figured this out in other contexts, but you know, you are pioneering it in the sense 
in the modern day in the very place you are in. This is not something that most lawyers are like, yep, let's go ahead and go for it. You know, you really for sure. Can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And so, and then one, one more question, kind of going back to the nuts and bolts of this. So you said that you've purchased all of the land back for yourself for, well, for the, for your company. So, which is a cooperative, how did you go about doing that? So was it revenue that sort of drove that, those payments, those land payments, or was it sort of, I don't know, is somebody working in a farm job? I'm always curious, like, how did these big capital investments come to be? Because you still got to pay the bills, you know, like you still got to get, they're not, I mean, they're doing a huge service by giving you time and giving you like no interest, which is awesome. But at the end of the day, like the money is still, you're still going to have to cough up that money for that land. And so, yeah, tell me more about how you tackle that. Our business is is a direct market vegetable farm. We grow two acres of vegetables and we have had a flock of sheep the whole time. And we've also done pastured pigs some years. And so those are our, our revenue streams as a farm. We both have had winter jobs to some degree, at least. Yeah. And, and actually more recently, I, I worked year round one day a week as a postal carrier. So I had a year round one day a week kind of job. And that was really awesome for cash flow <laughs> personally. But yeah, so the way we ended up making this farm work, initially I invested some savings that I have to buy into that LLC. And then I had a few more like opportunities with with match savings, like business planning programs. I, I was in two of those over over several years. And and so those helped me buy more of the shares. And and then my uncle gave me a loan for that final push. And then the next shares that we bought were actually my co-farmer Emily wanting to wanting to like put some skin in the game in investment wise. And so she had a little fund that had been set up by her grandparents or something and, and she cashed that out and, and bought shares. So we both like just personally invested a lot at, at the beginning, especially. I think at least a few of our shares that we've bought have been have been like farm profit that we were able to funnel toward that capital. But by and large, most of them have been um, personal investment, which is, which is super interesting to, to think about, wow, we're like paying all of this money to, to, to do this thing that I think of as a service to our community. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the world we live in. And, and I'm really happy to, to be in a position to be able to do that. Another um, very logistical question who pays property taxes? I guess your percent of ownership, as it increased, you probably paid more and more of those property. You just paid, you know, based on how what percentage of well the, the farm you owned, right? Yeah. So, so when the piece of the farm that was in my name from from early on that I've always paid property tax on, the rest of the LLC that is owned the, the land that's owned by the LLC, the LLC pays the property taxes, which means it has its own bank account and it has rent that's coming in from either the renters before me or me. And it uses that to pay property tax. So, so yeah, it gets like distributed out among shareholders that income and expenses all do, but it's, it's not a direct, um, it's just the LLC pays the property. Yeah. And that's, that's super interesting too. Cause so now I'm understanding that the rest of the land that you didn't own quite yet, you were paying rent on before you owned it. And so that's what was keeping that other bank account rolling. So then, you know, their initial investments aren't just diminishing um, as they're paying property to have all these expenses and no, right. so your rent was tossing into that account. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. And they, they cut me a deal on rent. You know, it was, it was pretty cheap rent, 50 bucks an acre. Let's talk about housing. So was there housing on this land? Did you guys live off site? Yeah. Uh, great question. So uh, yeah, the land was totally undeveloped when I first got ownership of that piece. And what ended up happening was the first year there, some friends of mine had lived in a yurt before and they still had the pieces of the yurt and they gave me those pieces. So I put up a yurt and I, I lived in it. Yeah, starting in 2017. And 
I lived in it through 2021. So it was five years, five seasons. And that was that was my living situation on the farm, which is probably not totally kosher with zoning laws, um, but no one tipped them off. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so that was that was great. And, and then in the winters, in January and February, I never really stayed in the yurt. Um, so I, I found house sitting gigs and other things to make that work. Emily, my co-farmer, she started farming with me the first year that that we had that piece of land. And she had a rental situation in town that she kept that year, that first year. And then, yeah, I guess two years, she didn't have a spot on the farm. And then year three, she built a tiny house out of a prefab shed and, and put it on the farm. So, um yeah, both of us kind of in these provisional living situations. Finally, in 2021, over the course of that year, we had a house built on the farm as part of a like bigger vision to like make our farm able to be home to more people and able to be a comfortable home <laughs> to to everyone involved. And so yeah, now we live in a now we live in a nice house, a nice brand new house. <laughs> wow. And you waited till lumber prices were perfect for that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I will say though our our mortgage on the house what is the interest rate was super low. So that's great. That's true. Yeah, that's true. You guys have probably definitely recouped that cost. That was a perfect time. <laughs> nice. And so that so that home was purchased with like personal that's like a that was a personal investment on behalf of you and your partner. Well, so yeah, that's a whole other thing. So yeah, the house is actually owned by Humble Hands Harvest, um by our business. And we made that choice because we have organized ourselves as a worker-owned co-op, which like one some of the kind of essential reasons that we organize ourselves that way is because we want to have a mechanism for onboarding new members and bringing new people into ownership and then also have mechanisms for offboarding retiring members or whatever and 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 treating everyone's capital fairly and all of that stuff yeah so i didn't want to like personally own the house there because you know what if i retire and like there's a whole rigmarole of figuring out what to do with the house and, and humble hands harvest was owning the land anyway. So yeah. So it made sense for us to, to own the house as, as humble hands harvest, which means that whoever is owning the business, whoever's a, a co-op member of, of our worker owner of our business is, is a co-owner of the house. And that doesn't require them to live in the house, but it, it just means that they, they are the ownership. So yeah, that's <laughs> pretty weird in that way. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is what what a interesting I feel like your accountant was probably just like, all right, let's let's figure this out because this is funky. But it's you know, it is I really do think that's what it takes to figure this out because you're right, like you are you are weaving in succession so far before you're gonna need it, which is really cool. And so yeah, tell us more about your business itself is a worker co-op. So it's you and your farming partner and what two other members that are working on the team? So yeah, there are two employees right now and both of them can are kind of on track to onboard into into ownership in the next couple of years if if they want to. And yeah, so so it started with just so our our business the way it actually started was that I knew that I wanted someone to farm with me. I knew that I had access to this piece of land and I was going to own it. And Emily just happened to be in in the right place at the right time in the community at the same time. She also happens to be my second cousin, so with, there was this like distant family connection that was that was a little bit of built-in trust that happened there. But I asked her, I invited her to to farm with me, and she thought about it for a second and was like, "Sure." <laughs> um, and, and we figured it out. And so, but anyway, our first year, we didn't know how long this co-farming relationship was going to last. We were just trying it out. So we, we just opened up a bank account and each put in equal amounts of money to that bank account. And I had a bunch of, a bunch of stuff 
and I was owning the land. And so the the farm business was going to pay me rent. So that was the way we we started our first year. But then after that first year, Emily was like, yeah, I want to do this long term. I want some skin in the game. And so that's when we really sat down and thought about how we were going to organize our business so that that my investments, which were at that point more than hers, could be treated fairly, but like we weren't going to pay me more because I had more money invested. Um, and so like just figuring all of that out. And and that's when the worker co-op model was introduced to us. And then we we had some bylaws that we that some just like example bylaws that we used from the Sustainable Economies Law Center that that helped us kind of think through and write our own. I'm curious about your exit strategy. Like if you decided to quit farming, you know, in five years and you, cause you're the one that put in all of a ton of cash in the beginning, you know, through, through a bunch of different avenues, but you were the one originally that put all that money in. Um, is there a plan for the farm to get to a point where it pays you to leave? Like you can sell your, you can sell you all your shares. The way we've set it up is that we keep an account, a capital account for each member. So everything that I have invested is accounted for in my capital account. And so we know how much I've invested in the farm. And also like the the farm's profit every year, that, that gets distributed to capital accounts based on... Equal. E- oh, based on... An hours worked. Um, ah, Okay which we try to keep equal. So it's equally. And yeah, so we have that number. And then what we what we decided on, and we'll see how it works once it, we need to do it. But uh, what we decided on is that when a person leaves, their capital account will convert to a loan to the cooperative, which then the cooperative has to pay back and, and kind of a, a payment plan is is scheduled at that time. Yeah. So, so there isn't like a big, there might not be a big buyout. Although if a new member is onboarding at the same time and wants to invest, they could, that could go toward buying, buying the exiting member out. Um, Just depending on like what's, what's possible, what's available, what makes sense for the business and is fair to the exiting member. So you will be compensated for that original land investment. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. Everything that the farm owns is accounted for in within capital accounts. Um, we also uh, do have. So this is this is the other weird thing that we do, which is w- when we first started the farm and all this stuff, people gave us gifts. There were a couple of people who actually gifted their shares to me and we did a fundraiser to to put in the wealth that we put in the first year. And so that money that we've been gifted, we keep actually a separate capital account for because I don't want I don't want the gifts that the people gave to this project to enrich me personally. I want them to like continue to enrich the project. And so we we have this separate capital account and it's called the commons in our world. And, <laughs> and so that means that the commons is never going to leave the farm. So there's this element, there's this part of the capital holdings of the farm that belong to whoever is farming there within that business. And if we end up ever selling the farm business or something like that, then that's when we, we would basically discount the price of of the farm by that capital account as long as right someone else <laughs> <laughs> and this is so are you finding that your math background has helped a lot in organizing all these <laughs> accounting procedures i mean yeah so okay i have a very i i think it might be my math background which gives me a very like problems can be solved. That's my, that's my attitude. And so, yeah, we just, we just kind of make it work and make sure it makes sense to, to everyone involved, but it doesn't actually have to make sense to an accountant because bookkeeping for like taxes and whatever is a totally separate thing than our like internal, like capital accounting or like um, decision Mm -hmm. value our various contributions. 
Right. Because like you said, it doesn't actually matter. It's not like there there are legal nuances and tiny peculiarities that you must follow. But it ultimately, I think what matters most is that every member of the cooperative and in, in every sense understands what exactly the format is. And then the taxes get taken care of. That number gets sent to the accountant, taxes get taken care of. But within your company, you guys can ultimately decide what it looks like. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So so one thing that I really noticed about every you guys, you operate with so much intention, which I really love. It almost, it reminds me of holistic management. It reminds me of keeping yourself in the picture when you're designing your systems instead of, I think when we design a lot of our businesses, we kind of, you know, we think about our own health and our own um, financial success and our own, and our exit strategy and <laughs> all of, all of the things that make us human. We think about them after the fact and kind of panic about them in a way. And so one of those aspects that I really like that you've weaved into this whole thing is not only equity and making sure that people are bought into the business and everything, but you're seeing people as multidimensional people. And from what I understand, your farm kind of got rolling and then you were like, this is, I, I'm having trouble finding friends. And as a queer person, I'm having trouble. I'm a single person in rural Iowa. I'm having trouble finding a partner. And so tell us about the Queer Farming Network, um, how that came to be, and sort of what has come of it. The Queer Farmer Network, or the Queer Farmer Convergence, actually, I should say, started out of my out of my need for queer farmer community because I had I had a community of fellow farmers in my local area that was great but they weren't queer um and I I you know that's a need of mine is is community in the queer realm but like all of my queer friends lived in cities and didn't really get my lifestyle um and yeah and so a friend of mine said hey Hannah we can we can do this we can like make an instagram that will find the queer farmers and bring them to your farm um and so we did that with the um with the queer farmer convergence that was the first one was in 2018 um and then and then yeah a few people kind of picked up on that and put some work in and and made a queer farmer network which now has its own website and we've been hosting the Queer Farmer Convergence every year except for 2020 um, since then. And it's been it's been super fun to to kind of open my open the space on our farm for for kind of a totally different creative um, kind of thing to do in the middle of the growing season. <laughs> it's very fun. So there's one convergence each year. Are there sort of regional meetups or do people use this network in other ways? We're trying to build out the network so that it is used in other ways. At this point, there's been the convergence at Humble Hands at our farm, and there's been one in Virginia last year. And hopefully there will be more in other parts of the country all over the place. Um, yeah, but at this point, people from all over are coming to little old Decorah, Iowa, which is really nice to be able to have such a diverse crowd in our area. Yeah, and obviously the biggest purpose that that serves is just to kind of create a community and um, I guess some some resilience and that you guys are all going through, you know, these stories are somewhat shared amongst people in the farming community and trying to go about living in rural America and grow food and sell food. And, you know, all the, all that baggage that comes with it when you are queer or, you know, any of this identifying. And, and so is there anything that has surprised you about that network? Like besides the fact of just kind of sharing community and, you know, uh, people coming together and being like, oh my gosh, I can totally, yes, that's exactly what I'm going through. Um, has there been any other, any other surprising elements? Well, I'm not sure about surprising, but I will say that like one thing that I really need in my, in my kind of community connections is space to like think about big ideas and, and, and make new ways, chart new paths. And I think that the I, I think that I put that intention out there in my initial invitations to the queer farmer convergence and that that intention has kind of been able to carry through. So 
that we really do have super juicy conversations when when we get together and and that's a really valuable thing for me personally and I think I think it creates value for the network too because these these kinds of ideas they need you're you're exactly right I can so understand that you need to workshop them and people need to throw their hardest questions at your idea in order for you to keep honing something that makes sense um so that's really cool that's very exciting and so I guess I'll end our interview by asking what is your advice for the incoming beginner farming and ranching folks that might be listening to this podcast? The thing that comes to mind first is that I just think it's so important that everyone understands that like the work that you're trying to do is so important to the world. And and so even though the systems, the economic systems that we're in aren't set up for it. Um, that doesn't mean it's not important and not absolutely necessary. And so it, it, it does feel like, it feels to me like the like most challenging part is, is kind of to land access is remaking the economic systems or, or making, making systems that are going to actually work for, for the thing that we want to give to the world, which is maybe our work as, as farmers, as, as land stewards. So yeah. So just like not losing sight of the fact that this work is, is needed. And that barrier is a totally like societally constructed one and not one that should be there. (laughs) And, and um, so, which, which like is kind of unsatisfying because we need so many different people to be working on dismantling those barriers um, from so many in policy levels in, in terms of, yeah, in all kinds of realms. So hopefully you're not alone either in terms of, in terms of working on taking that apart and, and remaking something different. That's a great one. This is an impromptu question and I know it's hard to think on the spot, but if you have any, do you have any good book recommendations for folks to start thinking about these alternative designs, um, coming up with something creative like you have? Yeah. Well, okay. So I didn't mention earlier, but the the book that got me started thinking about perennials in the first place was Mark Shepard's um, Restoration Agriculture, which I, I do recommend. I haven't re- read it in a number of years, but I, I think I still recommend it. And then also in terms of the realm of economics, Sacred Economics by Charles Eisenstein was really impactful for me to think about. Yeah, just to think about the way our economy is structured, what interest does to the way we think and act in the world and to what our economy is like. And and yeah, tangible examples of ways that people are doing things differently. And then the other people that I'm super interested in are people that work on like the commons, the concept of the commons and commoning. There's a book called Free, Fair and Alive, The Insurgent Power of the Commons, I think is the is the title. And so that that's also a recommendation of mine. Wonderful. I have some reading to do. <laughs> well, thank you, Hannah, so much. I seriously, I cannot thank you enough. This is this is such important information that you've shared with us that is, I think, sometimes hard to dig into when you're having a, a day-to-day conversation. And I really value when um, people like you are able to really pull it apart for the rest of us and show us how it works. So I cannot thank you enough for sharing your time with us. Yeah, my pleasure. It's really fun to talk about. <laughs> If you would like to keep up with what Hannah's up to, you can go to her website, humblehandsharvest.com. Follow them on Instagram and Facebook at Humble Hands Harvest. And you can also find the Queer Farmer Network at queerfarmernetwork.org. looking for a way to become more involved in the regenerative agriculture community, please follow us on social media at Kivira Coalition. And I also highly recommend following our newsletter. You can sign up for that at kiviracoalition.org slash get 
news. Our newsletter goes out a couple times a month. It is jam-packed with job opportunities, events, uh, resources, all the fun stuff that you will find very helpful. And while we normally announce job opportunities at the end of this podcast, this month I am hogging the airwaves to share with you a webinar series called the New Agrarian Toolkit, a webinar series to dig deep and level up. Inspired by beginning agrarian input and years of conversations with folks like you, we've designed this webinar series for our program alumni as well as any beginning agrarian seeking community and diving deeper into topics like soil health, like excellent teams, launching a new enterprise, and mental health and agriculture. So bring your stories, your hard questions, and maybe dinner if you're catching us right after work. They are every month at 6 to 7.30 p.m. Mountain Time, and you can find more information and register for those webinars at kiviracoalition.org slash toolkit. Thank you for listening to Regeneration Rising, a podcast production of the Kavira Coalition. We'd like to thank our guests for taking the time to talk with us about their experiences. You can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, and other popular podcast platforms. Become a Patreon supporter by visiting kaviracoalition.org slash podcasts. We'd also like to thank Kavira staff members, Leah Ritchie, Taryn Dixon, Taylor Mulia, Lynn Whitbeck, and Caroline Caldwell for their contributions to producing this podcast. This episode was edited and engineered by Caleb Wenzel Fisher. Wanderlust, our theme music, was made by Scott Buckley. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the land.